Hello class, welcome to today's video on chapter four, sections one through three on exponential functions. Today we'll be looking at the introduction to the family of exponential functions, comparing linear and exponential functions, as well as graphs of exponential functions. Please make sure you write down important information, formulas, or patterns you see. Feel free to pause or rewind the video as you need, and don't forget to write down your summary and submit the summary via the online Wix before class. All right. Um, let's begin. So I went shopping for a flash drive and when I looked at the flash drive it was funny because there are so many different flash drives that were available and it seems like the sizes were changing and the levels of it, the uh, different sizes was very interesting. So I said let me look at a pattern and see if I can figure out a formula to describe the pattern that these flash drives um, are increasing in size at. And I remember back in the day, probably before you were born, when flash, flash drives weren't even at the gigawatt size, they were like at the megabyte size. Um, so um, that was a long time ago. But we're going to start off at one of the options uh, that were listed, which was one gigabyte, two gigabyte, four gigabyte, eight gigabyte, six gigabyte, and then um, 32 and 64 gigabytes. And we're going to use finite differences to look at, try and figure out if this is a linear, quadratic, cubic function. So we look at the first level of finite differences. And we see that the, um, the first level is not, in, the rate of change is not the same amount. It's not constant. So since it's not constant at the first level, that means this is not a linear function. So let's take a look at the rate of change at the second level. And that two rate of change is not constant. So that must mean it's not a quadratic equation. Let's take a look at the third level. The third level, the rate of change is not constant. So that implies that it's not a cubic uh, relationship. Let's try one more level, but I predict it's not gonna happen. It's not a constant rate of change at the fourth level. So all that means is that what we have here is something that is neither linear, it's neither quadratic, it's neither cubic, or it's neither quartic, okay? So there's a different type of level going on here. Let's see what that level can be described. So it seems like what's going on with this pattern of data is that the rate of change is changing um, often, but it's changing at a very familiar constant rate. So that must mean instead of increasing by the same amount, there must be some type of rate that's increasing by um, that's either a constant percent increase or constant percent decrease. So let's take a look at this table of values and look at a different type of differences, not by adding or subtracting, but by multiplying and or dividing. So instead of looking at how each um, number is increasing by adding or subtracting, we're looking at what number are we multiplying the previous amount by to get the new amount. And it seems like the number that we're multiplying the previous amount by to get the new number is 2. So what's a little bit different is instead of it increasing by 2, um, we are actually increasing it by a multiple of 2 or factoring of 2 or multiplying 2, however much you want to say. So the growth rate is actually um, going to be a growth factor of 200% or 2.0 and how you compute that at any point is to take a new value and divide it by the previous value and if that a value is the same number throughout then that must mean we have a constant uh, growth rate, constant percent increase or decrease and that's what we see here anytime we take a value and divide it by the previous value we always get two so since that number is constant and we're it's a result of dividing or multiplying and that means we have a growth factor and that growth factor is equal to two or in de and that's in decimal form but in percent form is 200 percent so we have now an expression that we can use to figure out the, the new amount. We take the initial amount and multiply it times the growth factor times the number of times that we're trying to get to. So in this case, our initial amount was 1, as we can see here. And our growth factor is 2. Okay. And the T would be, if, if I were to create another equation, this is the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one. Um, 
sorry, I didn't do that right. This is the initial one, so we're going to call this zero, but then this will be the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth. So that means this will be raised to the teeth power. So if I want to figure out what the new amount is, let's say at the fourth level, I do 1 times 2 to the 4, and I should get 16, okay? And the hint is the initial amount is when t is equal to 0, which is why it was 1 in this case. So now we have a different type of function that's not like linear, quadratic, or polynomial of the form, and the name of that function is exponential function. And the form looks something like this. Where as you can see here, we have the variables, um, the constants a and b, but a is not 0, and b is greater than 0. That's the only restrictions on our constants. And a represents the initial value, which was in our case was 1, and you can compute that when t is equal to 0. And b represents the growth factor, which in our case was 2, which is okay because it's greater than 0. And we can compute the growth factor by looking at equals to 1 plus r, where r is a decimal representation of the percent rate of change. So in our case, um, oops, in our case it was equal to uh, 1 plus another 100%, which is another 1. So rr was equal to 1 in our, in our example. Now that's because we were increasing, but if we were not increasing, then our uh, growth rate should have been um, less than 1 because you're not increasing by over 100%, you're decreasing. And in that case, your R would be um, less than 0, and your B value would be a number that's between 0 and 1 because if um, R is less than 0, then you're adding a, a, a smaller number than, um, and you're going to take away from 1, and that's why we have there, and that's called decay. And that's when it's changing. So we're going to look at examples for both a little bit later. So the graph of my exponential function is going to look something like that, where it's always going to be positive because remember we said that um, in this case, a is not 0. Well, in case we're assuming a is positive. And b is always in a between 0, I mean, it is greater than 1, so it's always increasing. But in the case where um, b is less than uh, 1 but greater than 0, then here the values are decreasing because you're decaying. You're getting smaller as you continue on. In this case, both these cases, a is greater than 0, which makes sense. So let's take a look at an example of how we would compute this. Here's an example 5 from your book. Carbon-14 decays at a rate of 11.4% every year. Write a formula for the quantity of a 2 hundred, I don't know what that notation is, sample remaining as a function of time. So if I look at it, it decays at a rate, so that means for my b, my b is going to be equal to, um, remember, 1 plus r, oops, well in this case, r um, is, is a negative number, so it's going to be 1 plus negative 11.4%. So I write 11.4% as a decimal as 0.114. And when I do that, I get that my B value or my decay rate is going to be 0 0.86, I believe. That's our decay rate. And so if you remember, F of T looks like A times B raised to the teeth power, where A is our initial amount. And then they said the sample initially was 200 UG. Okay. And we found out that our B was 0 0.886, and we raised that to the T. So they did say to write the formula for Q of T, so we're going to call this Q of T. And if I want to figure out what, how much of the sample will be left after 2,000 years, then all I have to do is evaluate this function when T is 2. Oops. And so I can do that by just substituting in 2 and then raising this to the second power. Oops, 2. Oops, raise that to the second power. And the answer I get is exactly 156.992 uh, UG sample remaining after 2,000 years. Okay.
So we've been working with linear functions and quadratic functions, but we want to compare linear and exponential functions. And if I have two functions, how do I know if they're linear? Or how do I know if they are um, exponential? And the way that you determine that is based off the rate of change. And so you can do finite differences at each level, um, or you can do figure out if they have a constant um, increase or if they have a constant ratio. And so to do that, you must first make sure that the x is changing at the same um, level, same increase, before you can compare the y values. Because if x is not changing at the same amount, then therefore we can't really compare these two yet unless the x values are changing at the same amount. And in this case, they are. So when I look at the increases, I can see that for the first function, the f of x, it's increasing by 15 for every 5 increase in x, whereas the second function, g of x, is not increasing by the same amount each time. So it's obvious to see that the linear function in this case would be f of x, and the nonlinear function is g of x. But how do I know if that's exponential if I can't tell by the increases of how much is adding? Well, I take a look at the quotients. So I brought my calculator to help me. Remember that earlier we said we divide the new value by the previous value. So I'm going to start with 2488.32 and divide it by 2073.6, and I get 1.2. Hmm. So then I'm going to take the um, 2073.6 and divide that by its previous value, which is 1728, and I get 1.2 as well. I'll take 1728 divided by... 140, I mean 1440, I get 1 1.2 as well, and then 1440 divided by 1200, 1 1.2 as well, vice versa, and then 1200 divided by 1000, which we know is to be 1 1.2 as well. So in this case, it seems like um, the growth factor is going to be 1.2, 1 1.2, 1 1.2, 1 1.2. So in this case, our B is equal to um, 1.2, oops, b is equal to 1.2, which is equal to 1 plus 0 0.2. So that implies that our r is equal to 0 0.2, okay? So in this case, it's easy to say that the second function would have to be a exponential function because it has a constant, oops, okay, draw a straight line, constant increase, um, in this case, increase. So if I, for a table of value that gives you y is a function of x in which the delta of x is constant, if the difference is, is constant, then the table represents a linear function. In other words, if you have a difference which is constant, that means you have repeated sums. So here's repeated sums of adding 15. Whereas here, in the case where we have the ratio of consecutive y values is constant, when we divide them by the previous one, we got 1 1.2, we get that's an exponential function, and that's because the products are repeated. We multiply it times 1.2 times 1.2 times 1.2. If we take a look at a, a linear function and an exponential function graph together, they may look very similar. As you can see, there's this point right here, sorry, uh, right here, where they look very much similar. So between two points, um, an exponential function could look linear, and a linear function could look exponential, but that's why you need more than just two points to be able to determine if it's linear or exponential. Um, because between any two points, there's always a straight line. But between any three points, if they're on the same line and it's linear, if they're not, then it's not linear. So let's take a look at the graph of exponential functions even further. And let's look and see what happens to the graph as I change A. And as you can see, as I change um, A in this particular example, um, A value, the start initial value is increasing. It seems like the larger the A, the higher the graph is. Um, and that's because the y-intercept is always the initial value. And the graph still has that curve, but um, the changing the a just increases the, um, the function on the y-axis, and it will change the y-intercept. If we take a look at um, on the dk level, um, if we keep a the same um, and we change the growth factor, I mean, the factor from uh, greater than 1 to less than 1, you can see that in this case, initial uh, 
the y-intercept is the same 50 the initial uh, value is 50 but by changing the growth rate and decreasing it you change um, kind of like the slope but remember the slope is not the same but you can change the curve of it okay and one thing to note as we get closer and closer I mean as we get as t increases to infinity it seems like the function seems to level out um, if it's decay and it really and it really goes to infinity if it's growth so f of x as f of x approaches some so here we have this line this horizontal line y equals k and as we can see here it doesn't seem like this graph will cross this uh, lower graph will cross that line if I move a graph up it doesn't seem like this graph will cross the line and that's because it's called something called a horizontal asymptote which means the function values will never go below this k value no matter how big or how small k is and even for growth we, we're going to have that k value line as well but it's um, never going to cross it even as x goes to negative infinity and we call these lines horizontal asymptotes and that means as x gets really big or really small the f of x value will either go to infinity or we will go approach the line k but it will never reach the line k and this is a notation that we look we use um, which means basically the limit all right this video has been long enough but it covers three sections i did put in some examples i encourage you to look at more examples to be more in depth um, and we'll be ready to start the unit in class on Monday.